About a year ago, I was introduced to True Niogen, a supplement specifically designed to boost a key cellular resource called NAD. That's short for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And I was really impressed with the research that showed that increased NAD levels can promote cellular repair, maintain healthy mitochondria, and increase energy throughout the trillions of cells in our body. I've been taking True Niogen ever since, and I am truly persuaded which is why I'm so excited to welcome them back to the program. Let's get into how True Niagen works. From age 40 to 60, humans can experience a 50% decline in NAD, leaving our cells with a shortage of that incredibly valuable energy resource. Additionally, things like immune stress, poor diet, even alcohol consumption can all deplete our cell NAD levels. Research suggests that increased NAD can support cellular defense against these physiological stressors. True Niagen is designed to boost NAD levels and is backed by clinical research and regulatory approvals. Now, while the research is still evolving, I am truly impressed by the possibilities surrounding NAD and the research behind True Niagen. And I suggest you check out their information for yourself. To learn more about the research, science, and to order your supply of True Niagen supplement, visit drdrew.com slash True Niagen and use the... Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. Complete with wind chimes. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I see you all up on Restream, and we also taking your calls at... Uh, oh. 984-237-3739. Again, that's 984-237-3739. So give us a call if you want to take questions with my special guest. First of all, the great Brad Williams is back from yesterday. Brad, welcome. Thank you for coming back. Hold on. Let me get him up here. I didn't know you were going to go into it so fast. There you are. Uh, I was trying to do last-minute repairs to my room to make sure you don't know what a sloth I am. Good. We can't <laughs> see anything wrong. It's all <laughs> good. That's important. And, good. Good. Uh, Give everybody the particulars where they can find you. Uh, as always, you can go to my website, bradwilliamscomedy.com, because comedy's back. We're touring again. Uh, my my tour schedule seems to change by the week, so constantly go to bradwilliamscomedy.com. Follow me on Twitter, at FunnyBrad, or at Instagram if you want to see pictures of an Asian dwarf baby, uh, <laughs> at Brad Williams Comic. That, that, that That's the reason why people look at my Instagram, not to see photos of me. They like my daughter. Asian dwarf baby, you can't beat it. <laughs> They're saying it sounds like my mic is not plugged in or it's not live, so it's coming off the computer. Or is something. that better? Is that better, everybody? Tell me that. Uh, Cole and Mar, who've been very kind and giving me some little feedback on the sound, how is that? Is that better? We checked it earlier. It seemed fine. It did seem fine. Uh, Always something. Here's somebody that uh, says that Brad used to buy sneakers from him. Uh, his name is Chris. Oh, I can't pronounce that last name. It's long. It, it, Chris, tell me, was it were you just a shoe salesman, or did he actually seek you out? What, what's the deal? What, 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 what was this some shady Better. deal in a van yeah. behind the Foot Locker? <laughs> like, what, how was it I used to buy sneakers from you? And also, one thing that I've noticed with the whole popularity of the Michael Jordan Last Dance documentary is everyone kept saying how expensive uh, that the Jordan sneakers were, and I was I was totally oblivious because my Jordans have always cost like 40 bucks. And I thought like, what's the big deal? And then I realized, oh, right. My feet are hobbit feet. They're very tiny. Uh, you're you're getting the my... kids version. They're getting them hooked at $40. So they buy the $300 sneaker when they're adults. Exactly. So my shoes weren't that expensive as a child, weren't that expensive as an adult. Now granted my selection isn't as big when I go in and ask for them to bring out uh, shoes that fit me. Most of them have lights blinking from them. Uh, <laughs> oh I think that's super cool. Or well, let's, let's bring in the other voice. She can't help herself, but she's comment here, on you, <laughs> which is Kay Smythe. Uh, Kay, give us your particulars where we can find you. Oh, uh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut anyone off. So hi guys. Thank you so much for having me back. Of course. Uh, so you can definitely find me at K Smythe, the most annoying name in the world. K-A-Y-S-M-Y-T-H-E. <laughs> um, but actually right now I'm consulting more, uh, for a firm called Approval Ready Consulting. You can catch me through there. I'm their senior consultant now for all of your research and writing needs. But, uh, yeah, Instagram for all of the really fun stuff and tell them about your background you're a sociologist tell me more so my background is as a social scientist uh i study groups of people and try to understand why they choose to live the way that they choose to live um or are stuck living the way that they want to live um yeah i just study groups of people and solve problems 
Um, God, I hate describing my job. It's my like. Let's talk about Brad again. Let's talk about Brad's feet. Well, let, Brad, let's talk about how you I know. How, do you, how how are you? So I think much what's, joy. what's more intriguing is how are you and Brad fan, friends? Uh, we have a mutual friend uh, who would come to my house for parties and brought this spunky uh, person, blonde pixie from across the pond. And it, it's funny because we're not really friends with the other person anymore, but uh, we, we, we kept the pixie from across the pond much nicer. <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm glad you said that, Brad, not me. But um, yeah, it was just like, I, I think I met Brad and I met Brad's wife. And you know, when you live in Los Angeles, you're kind of starved for real women, you know, like Drew, you've got one there with you, Susan, um, and Brad has married an incredible woman. And uh, I'm just, I'm lucky. I just bullied them into being my friend. I was like, oh, okay, you're great. Please don't leave me. Um, <laughs> And so that's how it is. But we haven't seen each other throughout this quarantine. And I've been working a lot and like slowly losing my mind. So this is great that we all get to be here today. So, Thank you so much for having us, Drew. You know, of course. I love you guys. And Susan, apparently there's big differences amongst our different volumes. Uh, K is a little loud. Brad's normal and I'm low. No, uh, no but that's so hard to believe. But I, I want to hear good. more of K anyway. Warm. Brad and I don't matter. <laughs> Okay, I think that's just how we here. we have here's the thing. Are. We have this is new Zoom. I've never done Zoom on this platform, and we have to work out the levels. I'm learning, so that's what we need. Um, Basically, I, all of all of the people watching are watching a live SNL sketch where we're just kind of figuring it out as we go. And uh, yes. <laughs> props, props well, to props to you, Susan, and everyone working all the okay. technicals of the show. I'm, I've got my hands in my pockets. I'm in my room. My job is easy. I get to look at Kay and Drew, who are just incredibly attractive. So uh, <laughs> my, so my job is very simple. So I'm going to, Drew, talk for us. because So I they're see. saying it's pretty good on Twitter. The Facebook is where they have complaints. Okay. Anyway, we, we're going to get Move back over to our to YouTube. So, so Kay, <laughs> given, Kay, given that you study people and study the trends and the look at the math a bit, <laughs> What do you make of what we bought? I, this is a giant question, but and you can choose to focus it wherever you wish. What do you make of what we've just been through in terms of, I, there's many topics I would love to hear from you on. So I'm just going to give you a, just a few for you to choose amongst or between. So like, um, I apologize for the cat. Sorry, I'm in the middle of moving. That's why I don't have the screen and everything behind me. Um, so I apologize. And the cats are just all out and about. Um, but that's a really, yeah, that's a huge question, Drew. So, oh God, there's like my personal opinion and, you know, I try to, you know, build from empirical evidence as much as possible, but, you know, there are definitely too many of us on the planet. So I feel like this was more than anticipated. So I suppose my hope is that moving forward, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's what your cat thinks of it we that's now are forced to, it. Can, can you get the virus by staring at a cat's butthole that's my whole <laughs> question <laughs> I've been quarantining um, all day every day sorry guys but uh, no I feel like um, I hope that socially and behaviorally we evolve from this um, I don't know that we will um, I think that we need to clearly pay our, you know, emergency responders a hell of a lot more. And uh, yeah, God, I mean, where do you want to begin? <laughs> well, yeah, let me, let me, let me, I'm just writing things down that I, I'm sort of interested in hearing your thoughts on. And, and, and Brad, you'll be happy to know uh, somebody on YouTube named Icewater. Is Brad a midget? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, you know what? See, this is what happens because I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. If yeah. I come out here and the first thing I talk about is the fact like, hey, look, creepy small hands, uh, giant head, and start making dwarf jokes, then people say, oh, it's a crutch. He always has to mention <laughs> that. But then if I don't mention it, if I just mention nothing about me being a little person at all, then everyone watches like, does he know? <laughs> is, he, is he aware? Is this, is, that funny? is this one of the side effects from the coronavirus? <laughs> he used to be six foot two. True story. Or, or, 
Or do they wonder, do, do, somehow do I not know? Or, or do we, does yeah. everybody watching not understand? Let me enlighten I you. In, I was in a grocery store uh, just doing some shopping and I saw a mother and a child and the child looked at me and just yelled out in the middle of a crowded grocery store, look what it did to him. Oh, no! And we all just had to deal with that situation. Uh, so yes, uh, to, to, to Iceman or whoever that is on YouTube, I assume uh, Iceman might be Val Kilmer. Uh, I will say, yes, I am a real life little person, not a fake little person. This is not CGI. Zoom hasn't picked out that filter yet. His name is uh, Ice, Ice Water. Ice Water. Is ice name. Water. Okay. I thought it was Iceman. I thought it was Val Kilmer. So, 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 okay, I'm going to ask you about a couple of um, model type questions. Uh, the Imperial College of London put forward some uh, catastrophic epidemiological models that were clearly excessive. I don't know how anyone looking at those models didn't see how profoundly off the mark they were from the beginning. I could tell just looking at them, they assumed no change in behavior, no uh, innovation, no uh, flexing of medical resources, no treatment advances, nothing. Just if this virus washed over us, everything being equal, here's the numbers, which of course is never how an epidemic works. And I started looking at uh, Dr. Neil Ferguson's previous uh, pronouncements about things like mad cow disease and other outbreaks they've had in Europe. And he was without exception off by a factor of 10 to 100 on every prediction he ever made. Why did oh we gosh. listen to him? Why did we listen to him? Well, here's, okay, I'm going to go really dark. I'm going to step away from the science and I'm going to, I'm going to throw out maybe like what is maybe a bit of a conspiracy theory, but Ooh. what is also my experience from working in journalism. But when the news media and a government is given the opportunity to scare people, they are given an opportunity to control people. They are given an opportunity to divide and conquer. And when you look at the data that lends itself to the fact that there are too many of us on the planet in the first place, you know, our leaders have to start making some pretty tough decisions. I mean, like we're not going to be able to sustain the number of people that exist on the planet if we keep at the current rate of growth. <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, sorry, this is like they, they're just doing this for comic relief to like help me out because I was going to get really <laughs> It helps. Because um, basically we're all going to die. Um, okay. So I think what you like, you know, if you go to like the darkest kind of space in the room, what you have here is um, an opportunity for, you know, mass psychosocial well, control. So, so let me um, let me interrupt you and say that throughout history, when tyranny steps in, it's almost never that a tyrannical leader rolls over people from a military standpoint or holds guns to their heads. Usually, I mean, of course it can happen, but usually what happens is people hand over their freedoms to a tyrant to protect them, the population, from some imagined or actually present external force. In this mm -hmm. case, we did it because we imagined we, that the Imperial College was correct and we handed over our freedoms to our government. And to be fair to them, the, the governors were primarily the ones responsible for this. It was a fog of war. It was a hard call, and I, I, I don't question their, their decision. But I'm certainly having a problem with the way we're rolling out of this as the evidence just keeps accumulating that we're go as good social distancing as wearing a mask as we are sheltering in place. What do you say? I mean, at this point, I would rather just because every time I do uh, any kind of work with you, whether it's like a radio show or coming on the um, on this brilliant live stream with you, Drew, people take my advice really seriously. Mm -hmm. So um, I think at this point, I'm just gonna defer to Darwin and say, look, if your gut feeling is that there's enough evidence to suggest that you can go out and keep licking windows and rolling around on the street um, on mass, be my guest. I don't care personally at this point. Um, if you wanna practice social distancing and maybe maintain the safety of your family, go ahead, but then, my concern is as a macro social scientist, you know, look, my childhood, I grew up like eating dirt, shoving things up my nose. Like I was vaccinated, obviously. 
um, but this was the 90s, so I think there was less, like, you know, hysteria or whatever. Um, but my concern is more what's, what are the these massive social changes going to do for younger generations? Like, are they going to be, because I don't know enough about this, like, are they going to be less immune because they're not going to be able to socialize enough? Like, I've got friends like Brad with a beautiful baby, and I've got another friend who's got a nine-month-old who has never spent time with another baby. And so I'm more concerned about the, you know, newer generations than the older ones. Because at this point, like, we're only in this situation because of them. And, yeah, survival of the fittest. Well, Brad, how are you dealing with that? Uh, for me, it's been uh, – there. there's never a good time to go through a pandemic. There's never a good time. For me, it's just been, okay, we have a newborn baby. This is the best time, if any, because we just stay home and we get to share in all these wonderful special moments of her being uh, – of our daughter being an infant. So uh, that's kind of how I'm liking to spin it uh, to, to, so I don't pull my hair out going, uh, going insane, but yeah, it, 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 everyone has had their own struggles and you, and you kind of said it Drew, uh, where you say, e even if you agree or disagree with what our governors are doing, I don't envy any governor in this situation because whatever decision they make, is gonna be uh, it has has dire consequences yeah. for either sides. You you either yep. have one side where you say let's open it all up and let's you know uh, it's hard. Yeah, the, the, your your and, point and, is it's hard, right? Yeah, and then and, and, yeah, I get that. And, and, and then cases spike, or or you say stay home, no one leave, no one go back to work, no one anything, and then people are out of work, and then people get evicted. So it, I do not envy our leaders in the situation i certainly don't know what the answer is uh travis is asking have there been confirmed cases of outdoor transmission in the u.s or the uk the only study i've seen on that is from china and out of 1500 transmissions only one was documented out of doors and it was the r naught was significantly lower out of doors than indoors we're gonna take a call here guys here is i got a couple calls waiting in fact so i'm gonna get right to Russell, what's up, Russell? Hey, Dr. Drew, how are you? We're good. What's happening? Um, I was just uh, curious about something I read on Reddit today. I have not experienced it myself, but I'm in uh, outside of Austin, Texas, and I'm reading about people getting shamed for wearing masks in stores. Um, for wearing masks, for not not for COVID. not wearing masks, but for wearing masks. Yes, like being confronted with, uh, I think it's politically motivated. Wow. You know, maybe conservative people who think it's a hoax or, right. or whatever. I don't have conspiracy theories about Bill Gates and the vaccine, but I, uh, have you heard about things like that happening? People being confronted for choosing to wear masks? I, I have heard strange things like that. I have no direct knowledge. Kay, you have a knowledge of that? Yeah, I, I was at the store... Like the air one here in Santa Monica, that sounds so pretentious when I say it. it's the closest one to my house. Um, <laughs> but I was in there and I don't have like a proper mask because I've just like, I've literally been so busy. I haven't had time to go out and get one. I just have a bandana. And I've had people come up to me and tell me to take it off. And I've also huh. been in the process of adjusting it to get my headphones in and people be like, oh, you're about to take off your mask. And I'm just there like, oh, do you know what? Live and let live. Like, I'm sorry, this is just, like, not what I moved to America to live around. I, I'm so confused. You you mean that in, in Santa Monica, they were shamed? That seems shocking to me. They, they shamed you for wow. wearing a mask in Santa Monica. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, there's, like, I think there's a lot of, um, there's, so California is a purple state. And I don't know if it's just because uh, a lot of the scientific evidence and like data, I guess, surrounding um, a lot of my research kind of leans towards the right, especially the homeless stuff. Mm. Um, but I get more people like closet Republicans contacting me on social media and even approaching me in real life on the west side of LA than anywhere else I've ever been in America. Wow, that's interesting. Mm. Brad, how yeah. about you, mask, mask stories? I mean, uh, I just think it's odd that now if you walk into a bank and you're not wearing a mask, that it's odd. <laughs> like it, it, it used to be if someone walked into a bank 
wearing a mask, they're like, oh, that's the bad guy. Now, if you're not wearing the mask, now you're just like, oh, wow, that, 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 that's the weird person. That's a, um, that, that guy's capable of anything. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had anything of people. I, I, had, I walk my dog around my neighborhood without a mask and someone has yelled at me to put one on, which it's like the closest human is 40 yards away. Uh, but at the same time, I don't get mad at people for doing that because there, there, there's so much misinformation out there. Every time I read an article, I go, okay, that's true. Maybe yeah. like, I don't, I don't know. So it's frustrating that all these people are going to these extremes of wear a mask, don't wear a mask. But it, at the same time, I get it. I understand that you, you get locked into one perspective, one point of view and then one person says one thing and you take it as absolute fact uh it, it, it's rough out there and i would i would advise people hopefully do multiple sources from multiple different points of view and then maybe arrive at your uh best opinion based on that russell my concern is that if we don't all do the mask and the social distancing which i will tell you that in the 1918 flu they thought had somewhere between a 75 percent and 100 percent efficacy of preventing transmission so mm -hmm. If we don't do that, we are squandering an opportunity. And if those of you that feel upset and, and frustrated with the lockdown don't want to see more restrictions, behave yourselves. Do this well until we and watch this thing continue to go down towards zero. And then we can start taking masks off and, and uh, thinking about shaking hands again and that sort of thing. Russell, does that answer your question? It does, yeah. Wasn't there a... Um a story about Gunnison, Colorado in the, the 1900s flu where they they walled themselves off and they were the only people that had a good survival rate. Or, do I have that right? It was I, I, I'm not familiar. I don't know they, that. They, they I, kept I'm, everybody out. Makes sense. I've been reading a lot about the, the uh, early 20th century flus. And uh, I, it, it, the things that happen, the things we say, the misinformation, the feelings about wearing masks and not wearing masks, it, you, you would If somebody just quoted people from 1918, you would have no way of knowing it wasn't on my restream right now because <laughs> we did exactly the same thing. And, and let me go back to Kay, who's our, our, our social scientist. Why does uh, misinformation, uh, what, the only thing that is absolutely universal in a pandemic is the spread of misinformation. Mm -hmm. That's always the case. Any explanation for that? Um, well, it's like a huge like marketing and sales opportunity, right? Like <laughs> anyone living under a capitalist regime is going to go, oh, people are scared. Let's sell them things that they don't really need, but that wow. we can make a lot of money for, like from. I think, I mean, I, I also want to just reiterate that I think everyone should be wearing masks. I mean, if the choice is do or don't wear one, just wear one. Like it's not hard. Um, like I think the new thing that we do now when we leave the house is we're like phone, wallet, keys, mask, um, <laughs> which is bizarre, but you know, I guess, yeah, that's like we, how we live now. But, uh, yeah, I think the spread of misinformation, it's just firstly, everyone is like a, you know, their own li little personal philosopher and encyclopedia in this day and age, just because of like particip uh, participation trophy culture and yeah you know, constructivism as like our main learning tool, you know, we, we all think that our opinion is a fact. So uh, I think misinformation is easy to spread because it makes people a lot of money. And that's the society you, we live in, guys. You, you also mentioned that governments will sort of fill in with more control and t sort of be opportunistic when people are facing something like this. Do you think they're doing that consciously? Or is that just sort of a a natural move for for governments oh that's um yeah i mean it's kind of like governments as as unnatural as they are um i think surely the most natural thing for them to do to survive during a pandemic like this is to assert as much control and figure out exactly what they can get away with over this uh period of time i'm not really sure that there are any set end goals though that's, I think, the biggest, my, my biggest fear right now or my biggest kind of contention with this pandemic is I can't figure out what the long-term kind of goals would be of this government other than, you know, obviously we're in an election year. Well, so. I, I wondered the same thing too. I, I really did. Uh, and by the way, someone in the restream, Shane, was asking about Robert Paul Champagne. We have checked in on him and he's doing very well. He was unaffected. 
by the uh, pandemic, and he never leaves his house anyway, so now he has an advantage to that. <laughs> uh, Brad, any ideas about where I, – I was asking Corolla today. I was saying, you know, what what does the state government plan to do with its tax revenue? I mean, you know, I, I, it's just – where what are they – what are they going to do? I, I, they've they've destroyed you know two th- a third of the economy, and they're not doing much to bring it back. How are they going to keep all these costly programs up? Well, uh, I am a college dropout who <laughs> makes uh, dick jokes in bars late at night. I'm not qualified to answer that question. Uh, yeah, you're I don't, I'm, you're just avoiding <laughs> the question. Kay, what do you think? <laughs> I don't have an answer. You, That's Brad. Why. God damn it. Now I got to answer this shit. <laughs> wrong. I mean, like, when I look at, like, like, okay, so when I look at California, what have you got? You've got uh, the housing market. So that's a huge, that brings in a huge amount of tax revenue. You've got tourism. You've got food, like agriculture. And you've got entertainment. And you've got tech. So if tech can go remote, great. But pretty much everything else is fucked. So I have no idea. I think it's going to be a full change into the guard, to be honest. I think, I honestly think when this is all said and done, California could potentially be a Republican state, like a Republican run state. Wow. That's well, interesting. I Kay, really Kay, Kay you, 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 you forgot one of the, I mean, you were very intelligent there, but you forgot one main industry that now is gaining so much ground in the land of California, only fans. Uh, only fans is going way up. And so while agriculture and entertainment and tech, uh, they're all doing okay. But uh, women and men showing various parts of themselves on only fans, I think is going to be one of our most prominent. What prominent is this? I don't know what you're talking about. What is this I mean, thing? Porn used to be like, like California was the Mecca for porn, right? So this yeah. is, this is disrupting. I thought you were going to say weed, and I was like, oh, yeah, of course, duh. <laughs> no. Remember that one. Weed. Oh, small. Uh, that's so small scale. What, hey, you guys, uh, you got to enlighten me. What is OnlyFans? I'm, I'm uh, out of it. I'll take this <laughs> one, okay? <laughs> uh, OnlyFans, Dr. Drew, is where uh, men and women uh, become sort of their own um, adult entertainment company and charge people a monthly fee to post photos, videos, and the like of themselves. Uh, now, they, I'm sure there are some OnlyFans out there that are very, uh, that, that are sort of PG rated, PG 13, where maybe you're just spouting opinions, but uh, the vast majority of them are, uh, hey, I'm out of work. Look at my boobs. So, <laughs> it, somebody says Patreon for private photos. Does that sound about right? Essentially, yes, yes. That's yeah. an interesting way of yeah. putting it. And they want to know what your, Brad, what your uh, fan-only count is. <laughs> Just telling you. Listen, it's, on, it's on the restream. Listen, I I like to support our economy. That's why. It's not for my personal of course. gain. Well, so what is it? What's your fan-only <laughs> count? I have some friends that, that that's what they want. That, that's how they have to make a living now. So, damn it, I'm a good friend. <laughs> So I will subscribe and, and watch. Uh, and now I'm tempted to even start one. I think dwarves and thongs would have a lot would, would have a lot of subscribers. So uh, yeah, see so, me on OnlyFans very soon. <laughs> somebody uh, is now uh, asking me what about her psychiatrist who prescribed gabapentin for alcohol cravings and withdrawal. That's a good move. That is an enlightened psychiatrist. That is a very safe medication, at least in moderate doses. Um, Dr. Drew, you should play in the NBA with that pivot. Wow. Yeah, well, I, I, here's what I'm doing, guys. I've got this restream in front of me from Facebook and YouTube and Periscope, and I'm, and I'm trying to keep up with them, and they get very upset if I don't answer questions. So I'm trying to pepper our little conversation here with their questions. So We were talking about porn, and then you went, here's how you cure your alcoholism and yeah. psychiatry, which don't get me wrong. It's what you call One a, leads to the other. What you call a transition, so I can go to calls and talk to Ben. Hey, Ben. And by the way, the number here is 984-237-3739. Go ahead, Ben. Hi, Drew. Hi, buddy. Uh, my name is Benny James. That sign six dump. I'm a janitor, and this fiasco has revealed a vulnerability in civilization, uh, and that is the speed at which we learn. How do we accept when we're wrong faster, and how do we learn uh, accurate information faster as a society? That's actually a really profound question, Ben. I, I mean, That's it, a, it, yeah, I, I, 
I have three or four, at least three different general ideas. One is that change happens in society very, very slowly over long periods of time or very quickly in a crisis. So we sort of, I, I'm not sure that's learning so much as adapting. So I'm, I'm in case said this earlier, we're expecting a lot of change. Let's call it adaptation mm. in terms of learning faster. Um, Wow. I mean, I have sort of two thoughts about that. Right now, we are stuck in a rhetorical world of emotion where learning is at a standstill. And my other thought is we, we have to treat, teach critical thinking so people understand the difference between emotions and persuasion and actually critical thought. But critical reasoning is a really tough skill to teach, and it's in short supply <laughs> right now. So I don't know. Kay, what do you think? I mean, you know, a kind of first practical policy we could invest, I mean, just like a tiny little bit more in education, right? I feel like there's like a little bit in the budget maybe we could take from like destroying entire nations and, you know, kind of feed it into our school system. So the, the people- only thing, The only pushback I would give you on that, Kay, is that whenever we do that, it, we, we, the more money we spend, the more ossified it seems to become, the less progress, at least in California, the less but we you, get. Yeah. It's, do you find that's more to do with the fact that most money that comes into California's public school system doesn't actually reach the classroom? So, something is, I don't know. Uh, something's going wrong, clearly. Something. But uh, I mean, I agree with your critical thinking. And honestly, I think we just need to be a little bit more motivated to be excited to learn about one another's differences. Like, I don't know, when I was growing up, like I was lucky, we got to travel a lot. And my parents' approach was, you know, literally like go out and make friends. Like you can walk and you can string a sentence together and introduce yourself in a couple of languages, like just go out. And that was like, that taught me the value of listening and learning from others because, you know, you never know what you're going to gain. But um, I feel like that motivation is just gone. Like people aren't excited to be a part of a community anymore. So like, what reason do they have to learn about one another? And so I guess it's also fixing that. I don't know. Maybe, that, maybe I'm just being super dark. So I'm trying to quit smoking at the moment and it's. <laughs> that's, <hard. laughs> that's not easy. That's not easy. You get the nicotine patches and gum and that kind of stuff. It'll help you, particularly the first two weeks. Brad, I know I'm not asking for a dick joke, but I want your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing is that, uh, and this is something that uh, I'm going to take an issue I have in my own marriage and, and apply it to society. When someone disagrees with you, you don't have to take it as a personal attack at right. everything of who you are. Right. When, so, when, so, when someone says, hey, I think you might be wrong about that, they're not saying your mother's a whore and you'll never amount to anything. Right. They're saying, hey, in that particular case, on that particular issue, maybe there's an alternative point of view. And, uh, and this is, I think, something that we all have to take into consideration when having discussions with people that have different opinions than us. If someone says something that is different than your opinion, that other person is not a horrible human being. They have a reason for thinking that way. And maybe when, when they tell you those reasons, and if you ask more questions, and if you listen, you will say like, oh, I kind of get why you think that way or why you come to that opinion. Right. So That's how we grow. That's how we yeah, change. So, so, so it's two things. Just because you disagree with somebody on one topic doesn't necessarily mean you're going to disagree with that person on everything. And Correct. it doesn't mean that's a bad person. This this business of turning everybody into a cartoon character that you can then say, he, that person's a Nazi, therefore anything I say or do to them, I'm justified. That yeah. that's, beyond, that's like primitive. It's not even childish. It's primitive. Mm -hmm. And we, yeah. we have to stop that. I totally yeah. agree. Can I ask you guys a question? Because I yeah. think like you both sort of just touched on something. Like, I mean, do you feel like we've become too competitive as a species because like everything you're talking about seems to come from like uh no i'm right and that to me screams like a mixture of like anger insecurity and competition i mean yeah. obviously like you know I, I, jasmine can beat the shit out of me so i'm sure that's not the case with you guys brad um, <laughs> just, like, you know like every time lanny comes out with something that i disagree with i'm just like okay you're wrong 
Um, but I don't do that with other people. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so, so okay. Brad, you answer, then I'll answer. But, uh, and then I'll get back uh, to Ben, who's on hold here still with us. Brad. Kay is referring to the fact that my wife is a martial artist. So when I, so when I disagree or when anyone disagrees with her, you're taking your life in your hands. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, I think that is, I, I think that is very true that Kay, I think that's a great point where there's some sort of competition sports. And it's like, if you insult my politician or you insult my philosophy, you're insulting my team and my right. team must win. And it's that's not, right. it, 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 it's not that there, there are times when both Republicans and Democrats and other say very smart things. And the vast majority of the time they say really horrible things, really yeah. dumb things. They can be right. And wouldn't it, wouldn't you take a news organization more seriously if every now and then they went against their quote unquote narrative? You know, it, if Fox News came out every now and then and said, wow, Trump yeah. blew it on that call, really wrong. You yep. might go, oh, maybe they're a little more objective and maybe I can trust more of what they say. I agree. But no, uh, both sides are so dug in and so into identity politics that they feel that if one thing is wrong, if they don't support one thing on their side, the whole side crumbles. And it, that's just not the case. Well, it's not It's not that the whole side crumbles. Is that they don't get the dopamine, z dopamine zing of expressing moral superiority, moral outrage. And yeah. part of that dopaminergic reward uh, mechanism is the Internet. Because I was talking to a, a research scientist in Cambridge, Kay. I talked to another. He was actually an American in, in Cambridge. And he was talking. He Author. studies uh, behavior on the web. And he was saying that if you, if you infuse your tweets or whatever it is you're communicating with moral language, particularly moral outrage, that's what goes viral. And that's what's likely mm -hmm. to be retweeted. And so mm -hmm. they, it's the signaling. It's not just the fear of the team losing. It's the signaling and the and the applause of the of the team that they're that they're going for. Interesting, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. people do that because they're lonely. Because it's easier to make friends on the internet than like it is to even. And I'm not just talking about quarantine. I'm talking about since like the kind of advent of social media and. I guess it's, all of that. it's easy in the way like or porn or any other gratification on the internet. It becomes sort of its own little crack pipe. Ben, we, we moved away from our caller. Ben, Ben, are we in the zone you were interested in or did we drift into something else? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think uh, there's a stratification of understanding for things and it can range anywhere from an instant understanding of the ramifications of something all the way down to just a symbolic understanding that something's wrong. And we gotta maybe understand that there's what's the what's the best way to disseminate uh, correct decision making, the most productive decision making information to each each level of where people are at. Well, that's, so, so that's where I, what I'm wondering. You you, <laughs> you brought up and that brings up a whole nother topic, which is experiential learning or wisdom, and that's where judgment comes from. Uh, I mean, you know, when we when, when people come in with their Google search on whatever diagnosis they have they're bringing a material that a second year medical student knows that training then goes on for another eight years on average of application and developing wisdom and skill of experiencing that illness in a clinical setting that's where judgment comes from and people don't quite know that they think information and uh, applied or experiential information is the same thing and it's it's infinitely different mm -hmm. oh what was that is that the cat? It's a baby. It's a baby or the cat? It's not a cat. I it's the baby. A, oh, baby. my my daughter is crying right outside the door. <laughs> I heard it. Susan's uterus <laughs> I know, contracted. I, I know the sound. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, so like you could hear that all the way oh, through yeah. a wall, and then <laughs> Susan's uterus just started vibrating like whoa, whoa. like you like it, it it so like women look at their uterus kind of like the same way that they uh that the tv show looked at lassie the dog like well well some some baby's in trouble whoa, whoa, where is it girl <laughs> she, uh, as susan speaks fluent baby Babies. she can translate what exactly was going on there through the wall it was, hi, Dad. Uh, oh, very he's, tired. He's sending you a greeting very tired that's what she is <laughs> 
No, I don't know. That Susan would have picked up on that one. So our number again is uh, 984-237-3739. My guests, uh, if any of you are just joining us on the stream, at Funny Brad is where you can follow Brad Williams and, of course, K Smythe at K, K-A-Y Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H-E, on all the usual outlets. And we're uh, taking your calls, as I said, and watching you guys also. People may notice that I'm changing the scenes because I just set this up today, and I'm having fun with it. I think it looks really good now. But I also have somebody that helped me set up the Zoom, and I want she's going to call in. I'm going to uh, as a guest because she, she has a couple of questions for you. Oh, right now? Yeah, but when it flips over, it's going to get a little messy, and I'll have to work on it. So you keep talking. Let me send her the. Can email. We, can, do I get to keep all my guests too? At the yeah, same I'm going to keep them. We'll, we'll keep them on and. Is that who we're calling I'm, in right I'm, now? I'm having so much fun with this. You have no idea. Like, I'm Why? Are you moving us around well, while we're on? You had a blue background first, and then I did the black background. I, you can't see it. It's on the screen. But I oh. think the black is better. Everybody needs to tell me if they like this better. Hey, <laughs> hey Kay, what, what are we going to do when this is over with, uh, with this homeless situation? I, I was getting a little bit of uh, optimism when uh, Newsom was starting to put people, it, what happened was, I don't know if you're aware of this, is that uh, the gangs became frightened about the COVID and they stopped distributing drugs. And guess what? The homeless population became willing to go indoors because they they were not strung out on meth anymore, or s- a lot were. And so they went indoors. But then, of course, as things lightened up, the drug dealers found them in the motels and hotels that the state took over and uh, are now distributing again. What are we going to do when uh, this COVID thing lightens up? Okay, so again, I don't want to get murdered by the cartel, and you guys always nearly get me murdered by the cartel. Yeah. And like, um, but like, okay, so I mean, at the end of the day, if you've got people centered in a location and there's a problem that can be addressed with legal means, address them. If you have a concentration of people in a space, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but if if there was like say a state of emergency placed on the homeless like that actually you know did anything yeah um, at this point in time would it be feasible for these healthcare i mean like as if the healthcare workers haven't done enough for us already this year but could they feasibly go into these hotels and treat people on site but again it just all comes back to the fact that there's no social programs to maintain any work that we do that's right that, so that's that's so that that is the missing ingredient is is the yeah. residential care piece, uh, and and by the way, and you can't render the care if the patient's not really enthusiastically embracing it, right? There's no way to get the care or or put people place people anything. You can't really do anything except sort of try to cajole people into some sort of relationship, which sometimes works, but yeah. it's a hard thing to scale. That's for sure. Okay, so we're gonna try this. You guys ready? And yeah. somebody else, it's going to change the screen. I don't know what's going to happen. Okay. First time for everything. Okay. Is she there? Wait, I just want her in. Okay, there. There we go. Yeah, okay. somebody else. It's going to change the screen. I don't know what's going to oh, happen. Oh, I hear you now back, Susan. It's uh, All we're hearing is your voice uh, on delay. Yeah. Is she there? Hi, Monica. Hi. Oh, Monica. Hi. So w- welcome to... I do see to Brad Williams and Kay Smith. Is Monica on the uh, on the on the uh, Zoom as well? Yeah, right. I think we're getting a little. Feedback. I turned off my mic just because. Well, this is the first time, so let's see how it goes. Monica, what's going on? How can I help? Hey, hey, hey. Um, first of all, I have a giant girl crush on Kate Shanahan. Oh, good. That she's a good one to have a girl crush on. She is seriously. Uh, there, there is. She's a serious biochemist. She's also an excellent family practitioner, but um, she's a real scientist, really trained in biochemistry. And and I, I first time I ever spoke to her about nutrition, she goes, "This is way too complicated to be able to make meaningful, meaningful comments on, except certain things I can say for sure." And then you've heard her since then talk about seed oils and things like that. And I thought, okay, that that's a scientist. That it's it's it is so nutrition is so complex. Uh, but uh, I do I do stand by the stuff that she's saying. So good for you. I also stand by the stuff that she's saying. I was listening yes yesterday or whenever she was on recently, and I was just like so excited about hearing her because so few people in the medical community and in the scientific community are talking about how awful, awful seed oils are. But there's a whole 
community of us on Twitter that are like preaching it loud and proud. And it was just really exciting for me to see her. And I, why not yesterday? Anyway, so, did, hey Monica, so, did, did uh, is this is your this seed oil crowd? Are you relying on uh, Kate's research, or did you come to it on your own? I haven't come to anything on my own. I am a student, a big time student of people like Kate, like um, uh, Ted Naiman, who talks about uh, PE ratio, protein versus energy ratio. There's a, a slew of medical doctors on the Twitter fitness community that are very, very clued into the science of uh, low carb, high protein, fat is good, animal fats are good, seed oils are bad. This whole thing, no sugar, no grains, Vinny, you know, I'm very, very, very plugged into all that stuff. Right. And so that's why I have loved seeing this folks on your show so much. It just really is validating and wonderful because there's such a, an entrenchment in the medical community from decades uh, of bad science, just straight up bad science. I, I know the paradigm shifts are very difficult. Once, once you get a certain sort of, we're, we're a little culty in medicine, the way we sort of get into things and um, follow our leaders. We really just are really good at that. And, uh, but let, well, the Susan, we take some more referrals from Monica and people we could have on the show that uh, are from that area that she thinks are interesting. And you had a question, right? I did have a question. Yeah. Um, so about a year ago, I started strength training and um, I, I shifted my diet. So I eat what I call carnivore adjacent, which is about 98% meat and animal products and uh, a little bit of berries and a little bit of dairy. And I know that meat is good for mitochondrial health, which is really important for us. Mm -hmm. And I do regular blood work. My question about is about true niagen because I've been hearing you talk about it and I've been on the website and I have my order halfway placed and then I leave the car and then I go back. My question is, I do a tremendous amount of blood work and will true niogen create a difference or a visible change in any of my blood markers that I'll be able to kind of look at what the data shows? Because that's what we look at right now. Yeah, when we probably not. Pro probably not. It's really just adjusting the oxidative state of the NAD system. Uh, let me. I'm, I've got a couple articles that, uh, that I like that I refer you to. One is uh, in Cell Metabolism. It's called From Ancient Pathways to Aging Cells. It's a pretty good sort of review of the effects of the NAD system. And the other is a, uh, this is in uh, Rejuvenation Research, Interacting NAD and Cell Senescence Pathways. So okay. there, there's, I am convinced, I've seen this data over and over and over again. I just, these are the two that caught my attention recently that the, the only thing I can't speak to is whether nicotine and nicotinamide riboside adequately raises NAD. And that's something that the scientists over at um, True Niagen convinced me of, but I don't have any direct data on that enough to take, get me taking the medication or it's not even called medication supplement, me taking the yeah. supplement. Um, and I'll be darned if I, 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 I my instant, I, I'm not, I'm not even an anecdote, uh, you know, but I, I do think it's onto something here. And I know I'm going to interview uh, a physician that uses NAD infusions pretty soon to talk about recovery from things like uh, alcoholism and alcohol withdrawal. And so we'll get in deeper into NAD uh, in an upcoming, in an upcoming uh, uh, stream. But uh, I, will, Monica, I will keep you posted on this. Absolutely, I, I, I have Susan on it too, by the way. And it's you're sort of. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that, and yeah. I, I actually take um, uh, nicotinic acid. As yeah, and there, there's again, nicotinic acid is a little different, and I actually take nicotinamide also because it's been shown to reduce the risk of basal cells and actinic keratoses. So this is all kind of new science, and uh, you know, it's not at a point where. Well, the nicotinamide has been recommended. My, my dermatologist actually recommended that to me. But this is all stuff that is based on currently available scientific wisdom. It's hard to, it's hard for, I, I can't as a physician say, you as my patient, I want you to do X. We're, we're not there yet. But I can tell you, I made my wife do it. Because so, I thought it was the right thing for her to do. I really do. So, oh. uh, and, I, and again, the data on senescence, if, if senescence is just another way of saying aging. And uh, I am convinced that that NAD system has a real role to play in, in reducing senescence. And if nicotinamide riboside is having the effect that I think it is, 
and it should affect senescence. Um, Monica, uh, I want to get some more names from you. So you give them to Susan on who we should be talking to here that's from your uh, disciplines on diet, okay? Absolutely. I appreciate you calling in. I appreciate you, by the way, helping me out yesterday with the trolls. It was very kind of you. Very sweet. Yes. I went 13 rounds over you, man. I, I know. And I, I owe you. I, I don't know. I just sit there and think I, it, uh, it never goes anywhere. I apologize for how people get. It's very strange. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why people, why I evoke that kind of stuff. I, I, it just happens all the time. And I, I must be playing a role in it somehow. But I don't intend to. That's for sure. We need to talk to Kay about the cancel culture. All right. That'll be my next move. Thanks, Monica. Thanks. Is Monica still there? You got rid of her? Susan, you blocked Monica from me. I want to know that stuff is. I don't want to age. I, I know. It's, <laughs> I, I know. And that's I. That's why I got on this stuff. I was convinced by the science. Uh, yeah, it's a good thing. <laughs> bye, Monica. So, so Kay, uh, mob culture, is that what you want to talk about, Susan? Cancel culture? Yeah. So yeah, what was what happened yesterday? Uh, so uh, Robert Henderson, Rob Henderson was on, and Kay was, like, texting me during that show, the previous show we did with him. Yeah. And... Um, she was saying that she did her thesis on that. Um, he wrote the article, Reasons Why People Love to the Cancel Culture. And we did a whole podcast, and it was very interesting. He was very well-versed. And, and uh, Kay actually said that she wrote her – you wrote your dissertation? You wrote something in your – yeah, I did my my undergrad thesis on social capital, which is like the kind of uh, paradigm – the uh that we use in science it's basically like the science behind street cred it's like the easiest way to describe it and um i didn't like because i obviously know that people uh you know trolls on the internet like to harass you drew mm -hmm. um but i didn't realize the extent to it like i guess you got harassed again yesterday um and i mean i think for a lot of people they almost like gain social points when people obviously like like their post. I mean that's like pretty much common sense I feel at this point like every like that you get feels like um you gain capital um from the people around you from your social network and so I mean have you noticed that the trolls will be getting worse over time or are oh, they yeah oh yeah and yeah and and more uh, more mob like and and more dangerous more, more explicitly violent oh um God. And, and it just reminds me of the French Revolution. If, if they had a guillotine, they would use it. Uh, it's, it's, it's this cancel culture is the modern guillotine, and it, it's having profound effects on people. By the way, Kate, uh, I, did, you, did you change your camera angle or something? People are mm -hmm. all, all of a sudden commenting on you. And Monica, who we just talked to, wants to know where you got her, your top. <laughs> she forgot to ask you about that, so I'm asking for her. Monica was good enough to call You look good. Her. Oh my gosh, I think so. Um, Brad and Jasmine know this better than anyone. I have four outfits. I have my four outfits that I wear, and this is one of my four tops. You should see the pants. Okay, Monica wants the top, so where where oh, the top come from? Show the pants. Show the pants. So I've got my pants on. Susan, you're talking <laughs> over her explanation of the just, top. Just showing where, her. Where is the top from? I I don't know. I'm gonna have to oh. check. I have a horrible feeling it's Ross. Uh, <laughs> But it will yeah. be more comparable to that. You know, I, I refuse to spend more than like five bucks on clothes if I buy clothes at all at this point. And Susan, I'm so, so sorry about that dress of yours that I broke. That was yeah, it's okay. It was the old. most embarrassing moment of my life so far. <laughs> um, so, so, okay, I'll let you be. We'll go back to the cancel culture thing. But but the, the extreme moral um, outrage, the, the virtue signaling built on moral outrage, the you know, Brad, they want to know where you got your shirt too. Don't 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 want you to feel left out. Oh, um, yeah, this this shirt was on sale at Baby Gap, and uh, <laughs> I got it, and it fits me perfectly. And uh, yeah, so that's where I get the vast majority of my clothes. Um, yeah, show and, your boxes. Really, really, <laughs> this has become a new OnlyFans. This is this, this is what is this? Are yeah, no, I I, I I I wear actual clothes. I don't have like iron man on my uh, on my boxer but oh wait maybe i do uh, uh but yeah I, I i i think we're all looking very good today nice uh but Kay, back to the the cancel culture i like for instance i was taking very strong positions i i think i when you take a strong position you're you're putting yourself in harm's way 
And I've been taking some very st- – I, I only take strong opinions when I really sense I'm r- correct, uh, that at some level that the prevailing um, attitudes are wrong. I, I still – you know, I saw this panic coming. I saw the over – um, the shutdown coming and it would be an overreach and it would we didn't need to do that and there were other ways to contain this thing and I, you know I, I just could see it coming and I can see what we're doing with the homeless population and how, how profoundly awful and dangerous it is and the laws that need to be changed but when you get up and say something strong you're putting yourself in harm's way and I don't know how else to describe it but but strong I, maybe it's because I'm angry when I say it sometimes or no I think it's probably because you're almost certainly correct above all other opinions. Anyone that's contacting you, they're not even going to have a modicum of your intellectual capital on this subject matter. And so I always try to look at trolls as like a 50, 50 split of like, some of you could be getting paid by interest groups to shout me down because I'm saying things that will somehow cause detriment to your ability to make money or like harvest people i don't know mm. um like i've lost all faith in humanity i think at this point i don't know Interesting. but um the other kind of way i look at it is you know and unfortunately in entertainment you can't really take these risks i don't think in the same way that you can within science but you know, so long as you're taken care of and, you know, your friends are okay and, you know, these people literally aren't showing up at your house with pitchforks, there are always going to be mental bastards on the internet. And, you know, you can work as hard as you can to shut them out. But I, I don't know, like, you guys will have to tell me, like, within your kind of careers, are you kind of beholden to, like, actually ignore? acknowledge these people and their opinions because like i'm kind of spoiled as like a scientist in this if someone's like i disagree with you i'm like i don't fucking care yeah you call you call them the c word which i love Uh, i i i I, as a physician can't do anything because it's considered unprofessional and particularly if i hurt somebody i'm then i'm really violating ethical standards Mm -hmm. so i have to just take it and and sometimes when these frenzies get going there's a million people involved. It's right. it's not like there's yeah. a couple dozen uh, trolls. I, poor Susan, did you did you watch Ozark this year this season? I Kay? just block them. Yeah. You watch you, uh, you Brad. You saw it. Kate, you see Ozark this season? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Susan was on her way to a Walmart and a handle of <laughs> vodka. I kept telling her, I, I, "You're go, you're on your way. You're going to be in the parking lot of the Walmart with a handle of vodka. <laughs> These people are driving you to that point." Uh, and and by the way. The, you know, it's contemplating contacting the FBI and the police. Because I still of don't know the who the guy is who made that video, that horrible video of you. It's driving me insane. Yeah, well, I took a bunch of out of, context, co- out of context comments, didn't include any of my comments about the CDC, which was, I punctuated Went viral. everything. Which listen to Dr. Fauci, listen to the CDC. Turned the world against you us. Know, and w- if I said yeah. things like, you won't get. You're li- uh, there were zero deaths in the United States when I was making the comments I was making, mm-hmm. uh, trying to calm people from the uh, paranoid uh, porn that was on our way. But why doesn't anybody? Well, I was on the show. I remember, like, people gave me grief afterwards, being like, "Oh, you know, like it's going to be so much worse," and you guys were downplaying it. And I remember just being like, "I yeah, don't think on the, understand day the huge social issues that are going to occur if we don't all band together right now and come to a common sense understanding of this." Well, right now we have a mental health problem too, where drug overdose and suicide is going to begin to rival the COVID deaths uh, very soon if we're not careful. Uh, and then what are we going to do with thirty percent unemployed in this country? It's just these things oh, are yeah. mind but Forcing people into poverty is a medical problem. That mm-hmm. there's medical consequences of poverty. So, please, there. And this is what I kept saying also is that people weren't. They were making very aggressive moves without considering the risk reward uh, ratio. And again. I'm not questioning the overreach and that it was excessive, and I, I thought it was at the time, but I signed up for it. I, I thought it was our duty as citizens to follow our governors. We had very difficult decisions to make, but now it's becoming pretty clear that, that it's excessive and that the consequences are going to be profound if we don't do something, and so let's do something. I just block them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to the team mom these you know they're always going off after us and also the endometriosis we went through those guys and then we also went through the twin med people they were mad at us for a while but that all kind of stopped and then this 
was just huge. It was unbelievable. So bring on the Teen Mom <laughs> thing. Yeah, I love them now. It's not so easy compared right, to Right, that's low key. Uh, Richard. But they're not trying to take your license, and you're not a. If I see the quack word one more time, I'm telling you. Uh, Richard, <laughs> you're talking about Bert Kreischer <laughs> here. Did he say something racist? What happened? Oh, my <laughs> oh really? Oh Bert? my goodness! I uh, yeah, that's exactly. I don't. Bert wouldn't do that. I, I would <laughs> think not. Uh, but anyway, Kay, any recommendations? Given that that was your <laughs> undergraduate thesis. Um. Look, the way that we kind of approach it here at home. Um is everyone's opinion of me is none of my business. Like, I think, I tell Brad and Jasmine this all the time. I think it's those two, um, and I mean, you and Susan, and probably in the entire world, less than 20 people who I think know me, me personally. So their opinions really matter. Your guys' opinions really matter in my life. Everyone else can fuck off unless they're cleverer than me in that particular field. <laughs> and so you can approach life like that, Great. And if stuff gets scary, I mean, you can only deal with it from a personal perspective. I guess the issue with the trolls is they're always going to exist if the internet exists. There's, li there's literally nothing we can do so long as social media and these platforms exist and they exist by making money off people being spurred on and joining like, you know, these sides and competing against one another for these like hypothetical social points like they're always going to exist so it's about your personal approach i think i don't know but then maybe there's something wrong with me and i just don't care but uh well, it's good no that's why i, re I rely on you to take uh, aggressive measures to to do because because some, some of the attitudes of again we were you and i were working very hard on the homeless thing and some of these people were really dangerous they literally were maintaining a status quo that was killing people every day now, right now, I don't know what the data is on deaths because of homelessness because we can't see it with the fog of war here from COVID, but I'm certain it's not much better than it's been. Well, one thing I did see, um, so I have a lot of, uh, I guess, sources then, um, throw back to the journalism days, who are um, who are either in LAFD, Santa Monica PD, uh, the fire department out here. And a lot of their data has shown that Certainly, um, I would say, okay, I don't even want to say like the neighborhood it is, but let's just say a very well known homeless encampment in Los Angeles. You know, in all of the testing that they did on several thousand homeless, there were seven cases of COVID. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, two weeks ago. So, like, right at the peak of all mm -hmm. of this. And my concern, again, is just as it's as much as about the misinformation. I'm more concerned about the misinformation at this point and how many people are going to die as a result of that and yeah i mean the trolls just slow me down at this point i just can't like just get out of my way like people are dying i don't care about your opinions um, I, let me i want to i looking at the stream here abba zaba you keep asking very elaborate very specific questions about uh endometriosis pid miscarriages uh and uh various kinds of uh vulvar cysts and things uh, you want to know odds of carrying a child, you need to see a fertility specialist. There's no way and someone could just answer that question just like that. You need to have a full fertility a workup, and I'm certain there's a lot they can do to help you, a lot. Uh, but the sooner you get a fertility, go see a fertility specialist, the better. Brad, you're bringing a baby into this world. Ah! You know, right? <laughs> I picked a hell of a time to uh, become a father. Now, now when we're all locked down and we're all panicked and, and we all, when we don't know if we're going to start shaking hands again. And, uh, I, I, all, all I know is I, I'm, I'm very, I like to look at the silver linings of every situation, no matter how horrid. And yes, the pandemic is awful. What it's done to the economy, what it's done to human life, all that is horrible. But if it means that People are more hesitant to run up to my, uh, to my, to myself or my daughter, who are both dwarves, and randomly pick us up. Silver lining, okay? <laughs> like I, we, we, we don't like being picked up. I'm a, I'm a 36 year old man. Uh, just because you see me on the street and I look light and adorable doesn't give you the right to uh, reenact your favorite scene from The Lion King. Oh. Is, <laughs> yeah. So don't do that. <laughs> Stay oh away. At least I won't have to take <laughs> selfies anymore, Jerry. 
<laughs> what? I want to have to take selfies for you or take pictures with your fans. If what? Are your, fa- are your fans going to come up to you anymore and ask you to like? Oh, I mean because of the <laughs> because of this. Oh yeah, that's Make interesting. Make me take a picture. Interesting. Maybe not. Look at that. I want to follow up with Abizab again. Yes, Abizab, I do think there'll be a ton to be done. A ton, a ton, a ton. Uh, so do do get that done. Um, and why you're having repeated pelvic inflammatory disease, that needs to be addressed. Also, uh, Stuart, I'm probably not going to get to your call. You're wondering whether or not you should have a hernia surgery during the COVID outbreak. Uh, that is between you and your surgeon. It's an outpatient procedure. Usually you go home the same day. Um, and most hospitals have restarted, uh, started up again with the elective procedures, and there's do, you shouldn't be delaying medical intervention at this point, uh, at least not if your doctors are saying to proceed that this hospital is secure, so to speak, or the outpatient surgery center is good. It it's really doesn't make sense to delay medical treatments right now. There's much more trouble. We're, again, this is another of the risk-reward unintended consequences. This whole thing has caused a ton of problems in terms of surgeries that should have been done, cancer treatments that should have uh, been done, heart attacks that could have been avoided, lot strokes that were uh, improperly uh, managed because people delayed coming in. So there's a lot, a of, lot of real consequence to what we've done here. Well, Drew, I was going to ask. Um, so I was at the doctors probably about a month into the pandemic, um, just for kind of a routine checkup. Uh, down at, I just go to the Planned Parenthood down here in Santa Monica because I'm terrified of the American healthcare system. I literally used to go to the surgery around the corner that I've been going to for like my entire life and I would just go in, see the doctor, not have to pay anything and go home. So I'm too scared to go and get a primary caregiver out here yet. But when I was there, I was told like in no uncertain terms that I needed to go and get a cancer screening like that day and that, um, they were doing no uh, cervical cancer screenings oh. for the, like m- like the entire time this quarantine's been going on, and wow. I called so many different. No one, not even a friend, could get me like a black market cervical screening. It's uh, yeah, so I don't even know if that's like opened up back yet or anything. I would think I would think you there. I know guy, plenty of gynecologists. I'm getting a mammogram on Monday. Yeah, plenty of gynecologists continued to operate. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah. you should be fine with that. And do do take care of the proper health care. Yeah, my my um, obstetrician's office is open now. Marie, okay. is that somebody you're giving a specific referral? Is that a gynecologist, gynecologist. in the Santa Monica area, Marie? Marie Golet? Tell, tell us. She's making a specific recommendation for you. Oh, okay. let's see. Thank may you. Get, yes, may get you into primary please. care. Yeah. I would love that. I should probably grow up and get one. I have been here now for like five it's years. It's time. It is time. Yeah, I, was, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to stay. I don't know if I'm going to stay. And now that I'm staying, I'm like, well, if you go to a gynecologist, you don't need like a primary care person unless you have other issues. Right. I mean, well, it's, it's, you don't really need a, an internist till you're older, till you're like 50 or so. Uh, having a gynecologist can function as the, as the uh, primary care person. Dr. Clara B. Vogel? Why do uh, I know that? Yeah, Clara B. Vogel is I'll who t- she recommended. Uh, find out if yes, Santa Monica. So there you go. I'll take that. I'll take that as a. I think actually, I think I've heard her name before. Uh, Let's have her on the show. I know. <laughs> I have a feeling that might be <laughs> where uh, Cara Cara works. Cara rather. Oh, maybe. Um, no. But in any event, uh, Andrew, who's always a great source of advice for us, um, I have not seen any updates. I'm looking at the COVID19.healthdata.org. I looked at many of their. They spent so much time updating other countries, particularly Brazil. Oh, here we go. They just updated us. Mm. So, um, hey, do you guys mind if I do a little aside? Are you falling on... asleep, Brad? No, I'm, I, I, I want to hear what the updates. You just got okay, me. Good. Good. Yeah, they just updated. I'm looking at Georgia, which is where I always look because I want to see if the social distancing is having an effect. And their daily death rate is dropping. Their um, their estimated uh, everything's dropping, dropping, dropping. Now this data only goes until the until May twenty third, so it's a couple of days outdated. But uh, confirmed cases went up a little bit. It's bouncing around a little bit, but estimated cases based backed out of the death rate continue to drop. So Georgia is still on a rapid uh, downfall in cases. Florida, the same thing. Um, it's sort of plateaued on the death rate, but the death rate is only at around forty. And it's generally trending down. And again, the estimated case, w- which is a sort of a bastardized um, view of the death rate, it's uh, and the hospitalization rate staying down. So now let's look at California and New York. Uh, California 
Sorry to put you guys through this. It was kind of interesting. Uh, okay. They just updated this data. Uh, the California data, it's looking good. It's plateaued. It's heading, heading down, if anything. It's a little bit plateau-y in California. It's a little bit sort of static. Uh, about 2,000 confirmed cases. Uh, no, Yes, and about 11,000 estimated. So we still have a number of cases flying around here in California, but the, uh, the trends are all flat to down which uh, is presumably, let's see if they incorporated the movement. Yeah, show, including in that is us moving around the, the state a bit more than we were. New York uh, is having uh, really good results. There are uh, similar uh, cases to California. Death rate's falling rapidly and way, way, way down from where its peaks were. Um, 30,000 total, easily meeting hospital resource needs. And now let's look at the United States generally, which is sort of the more interest, another interesting bit of data. Uh, takes a second to get it. This is uh, again for those of you wonder where I'm looking. I'm looking at COVID19.healthdata.org. Uh, there been no real change in the hospital resource use. The death rate is it looks like it's going to be about 130,000 before we're into August, and the de daily death rates are dropping, dropping rather rather steadily. Let's say. Uh, overall in the country, and that's a significant change. Now, I would say the one thing that the one th that, you know we always talk about, or I always talk about, the fog of war we've been in. When you can see a trend, that's when you're sort of emerging from the fog of war. And there is a very definite trend here in terms of the daily death rates in the United States of America. So that is very, very, very good news. Um, so there's still a little bit of choppiness and a little bit of plateauing here and there, but uh, overall, it's it's looking pretty good. Sorry, guys, I didn't interrupt with that. No, that's yep. good to know. Yeah, yeah, no problem. That's that's good information. I feel like uh, all all too often when we're turning on the news or checking Twitter, it's all doom and gloom, and we're all going to die. So it's nice to hear that. You know, what, what they'll you know, pick out are the states that are still plateauing or going up, perhaps, and uh, of course there are going to be some like that. Uh, we, sure. You know, it's it's thus far there are about seventeen that have yet to really plateau, but they have very few cases typically in those. Pennsylvania is looking a little choppy. Somebody asked me about Pennsylvania. Let me go to their death. Oh, I've got the spinning wheel. Hold on a second. There we go. Uh, it is trending kind of downward. And it's expected to go downward. In the hospital resource use is not a problem. Also going downward. A lot of plateau in a lot of this data. Um, looks pretty good. Looks significantly improved, I would say, in Philadelphia from the last time they posted this data. The, the last time I, I was looking at Pennsylvania, based on the previous uh, graphs, it looked a little concerning. Now it's plateauing to down. So all the it's all the data looks really pretty darn good. Uh, we should feel we should feel really good. But my fear, guys, is that we're going to squander this opportunity to really keep it going down. We we don't want it to turn around and go back up again. So let's uh, let's be appropriately cautious as we uh, find our way back into the world. And then if this really keeps going down in a few weeks, maybe we can talk about loosening things up a little bit. Um, are, are, Drew, uh, are you directly talking to the people that were in that pool party in the, in the Ozarks? Well, I, not only am I talking to them, I, I want somebody to I want a scientist to follow them so we can see how much transmission occurred, if any. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, New York Times shows steady increases in California. California is a plateau-y, I would say. There are some. There was a little bump, but I wouldn't say a, by no means is there a steady increase. Uh, and then, Margaret, you said something I wanted to – oh, changes in treatment. There is some rather extraordinary research going on in treatment right now, some very novel and interesting things that maybe in the next it, month or so we'll start hearing. Is, uh, is, is Susan's uterus vibrating? Because I think my daughter just – Woke up from her nap. All right. You, I'm going to let you guys go. I'm going to wrap this thing up because I need to go to, be a dad. You can go. Kate can go back to her cat. Then Brad can oh, go back to the baby. Oh, it's time to walk the dog. Baby. Oh, oh, you're late. I'll go back to my cat. Oh, are we going to get in trouble? You're Who, late. Who's got to walk the dog? dog Who does? Me. Brad? Me. All right. Yes. Get out of here. So the baby can go to bed. <laughs> Tell everybody where they can find you again. Uh, bradwilliamscomedy.com on, on my Instagram at bradwilliamscomic or on Twitter at funnybrad follow and I hope to see you in the uh, audience while we have one third of comedy clubs at capacity like we do one third capacity they usually do temperature checks at the door people are taking precautions so that we can have live comedy again 
please go to bradwilliamscomedy.com and see if I'm coming to a state near you. Great. Yes. Thanks, Brad. And Kay, great to see you as always. Thank you for all your help. And we'll <laughs> we'll continue to apply the pressure to try to, to help people because uh, there's plenty of room for uh, improvement in this damn state of God ours. God bless you both. California you particularly. Do what you do. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye. Keep Bye-bye. doing what you guys do. Bye. Bye. So let me just address what the New York Times is calling a steady increase. So you're looking at um, an increase in estimated cases. Uh, in terms of t- overall cases, yeah, there's been an increase of 200 um, confirmed infections. But it's, it's, it's the same, essentially the same number as it's been all along. It's not significantly different. It's just sort of a plateau. So I was saying plateau And if you look at the daily death rates, that's a little plateau-y kind of too. But it's going to, according to these predictions, it's going to take a very steep turn downward. So the idea, again, this is the press, again, doing their thing. Steady increases. Yeah, it, it is technically, you're right, but not meaningfully so. So why don't we say we're doing a great job in California. We have to be perseverant still. We don't want to see this thing start to pick up steam and start to reverse its trend. And by the way, it's been consistently extremely low the entire time. We have just crushed the curve here in California. This this state has 35 million people in it. The fact that we have a couple thousand uh, viral infections is a, compare it to a state, say, the size of Maryland or the size of Massachusetts, and you'll see we are doing awfully well. And uh, I want to see it go to zero, too, but it's going to be very, that's a tough thing to get to. It's very tough. In the meantime, we really need to practice our social distancing and our mask wearing and our hand washing. And hopefully it will be just about as good as the lockdown so we can continue to engage in our lives, which would be great. Um, uh, I don't know what you're somebody's saying reported seven day average up 30 percent in four weeks. Who is saying that? Uh, that is uh, I can't quite read your name. Reported cases, seven day average up 30 percent in four weeks, seven day average up 30 percent. So let's let's look at how they distorted that data. So a seven day average would in the last week would be uh, about 100 cases per day, right? And so if it's up 30%, you're talking, let me see, let me get this right, 17, 17, 19, 2,000, that 100, about 100, let's say 150 case a day increase. So a 30% increase, that's it. I mean that that's a that's it's out of two thousand cases. It's it's not yes, it's a thirty percent increase. It's not a exponential increase, which is what you see when things are breaking out. Uh this is something that our government is smartly planning to uh chase. And they've got these sort of these um detectives they call them. They're gonna chase the uh chase the little the, the outbreaks and check all their contacts and again, death rate going down. Death rate going down. Yeah, sixteen hundred to two thousand. That's exactly about right. Um, I'm not, we don't know that's a real change. Uh, again, especially when all the trends are trending down, the death rate's going down, everything is going down. Uh, monoclonal antibodies until we get a vaccine. Yeah, there's a whole thing, Clara, about monoclonal antibodies that may be coming our way. There's also some synthetic polymers. There's all kinds of interesting stuff that people are starting to do research on, and there's human, human analysis underway. So if um, this can be shown to be safe and have some efficacy, you're going to you're really going to see the American healthcare system um, and its innovative potential. Uh, and in about two to four weeks, we might see some more stuff. So what is the death rate now? Do you want to know in the United States, uh, Chris, or in the California? Where, where are you looking? Yes, therapeutics are getting better. Therapeutics are getting better. Oh, my God, your password was on the screen, Susan. Well no, done. Th- well, it was for the Zoom meeting, but every Zoom meeting has a different number and password. Ah. I see. But we were done, so I hung up. <coughs> Why do you think the governor has decided that the beach is the battleground with the public? I have no idea. Out of doors in the sun is the safest place you can be. It's very clear. That's one thing we have learned in all this. Same thing in the 1918 flu. China has data on this. So I don't know why uh, why you would de- why you would elect to make that uh, a problem. Uh, I almost We almost saw three people die on some uh, rocks with surf <laughs> crashing in this weekend because lifeguards were running around the beach telling people to stand up because they were not allowed to sit down. This is the insanity. This is the unintended consequence of foolish policy. 
So anyway. A man with a baby on his shoulders walking over a jetty. And then a pregnant woman. Yeah. Uh, Amanda, the vitamin D thing is an associative finding so far. I'm taking vitamin D. I take about 10,000 units a day. Um, it's clear it w there is association between lower vitamin D levels and more COVID cases and more COVID problems. Uh, we as physicians are trying to get people vitamin D levels up for various reasons, health reasons. Um, it, it benefits a lot of different uh, conditions. So generally, vitamin D metabolism is a good idea, but talk to your doctor about that. What about <coughs> gyms? What's going to happen to gyms? To what? Gyms? Yeah. Yeah, that's the next stage in California. Um, that's a little harder, right? That's hard hard to keep gyms safe. I, I totally understand that. Um, I'm going to go to the United States and give you the fatality rates. Somebody's asking the death rate. And as I said, the death rate... Daily, you want the daily death rate we're talking about in the uh, United States, which is dropping nicely. Uh, right now, it is about 1,300 people. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It's still a serious thing, um, and uh, but it's going all in the right direction. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, the mental health issue, Stephen, is, is massive, and I'm going to begin uh, championing that very shortly. We have to begin to talk about suicide and drug overdose and drug use and alcoholism because that is now beginning to explode in the aftermath of the lockdown. So with that said, I will wrap this thing up. Susan, anything else on your uh, on your We're going to have, um, I, well, tonight you're going to be on. Uh, Fox 11, I'll be on there at 7 o'clock. We've got some interesting stuff. We're going to talk to the head of the Department of uh, Mental Health for L.A. County. So if you want to hear more about the mental health issues, we're going to talk to them about that. That's what we're moving into. And then, of course, we have Drew, Dr. Drew After Dark. And Yes, Dr. Drew After Dark, of course. And, and I would say, everybody, pr let's, be, let's not lose this. Let's not squander this opportunity. Be, be diligent. Why not? Why not wear the mask, do the distancing, let's, so we don't have to have somebody you know, questioning whether or not opening up was a good idea or not. Let's make it a good idea. Let's get back to our lives. And let's, let's uh, until things really go, go further down, let's practice uh, proper hand washing, mask wearing, safe distancing. And the last last uh, dose, we did a contest. I think it was Thursday, maybe. Okay. Um, but people didn't email me. So if you won a T-shirt last Thursday, email me at drdrew.com slash contact and give me your name and your size and your address. Hey, I owe Pyro. I was on the fighter and the kid a couple of few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Uh, all right, guys, thank you so much for spending time with us. I hope this was interesting for you. And uh, we on tomorrow, what time, Susan? I don't know. Uh, let me look uh, before <laughs> I sign out here. So can't I remember. Kind of estimate. Uh, probably 3 o'clock because I've got Jason Ellis at 4. Is that okay? Okay. All right, we'll see you around 3 o'clock tomorrow. And I don't think we have any guests. Is that correct? Oh, yes, we do. The guy with the, the book that uh, – that, um, I'm sorry, I don't have that queued up. The the guy that um, what's the Indian guy's name that sent us the guest that was in the oh my gosh, we have a guest. The Indian guy that sent us the guest. <laughs> Would you know what the topic is? Uh, it's he. You said he had he. You sent me the guy. He has a book, and let me get his name. Let me let me get his name. Hold on one second. I want to upload it so I can't tell you. He's got the book, The Miracle Equation, Hal Elrod. Oh, yes. This is going to be interesting. He, two decisions that move your biggest goals from possible to probable. Yeah, it should be very interesting. So we'll talk to him to about inevitable. that. Inevitable. And uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. See you then. Okay.